From WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Politics Hour starring Tom Sherwood. I'm Kojo Namdi. Tom Sherwood is our resident analyst. He's a reporter with NBC4 and a columnist with the current newspapers. Tom Sherwood. Hello. Our guest today is Muriel Bowser, the mayor of the District of Columbia. Mayor Bowser, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure, Kojo, as always. That's a signal for you to start calling now, 800-433-8850. Start sending your email to kojo at wamu.org. You can go to our website, kojoshow.org. Watch the live video stream of this broadcast, ask a question or comment, or you can send us a tweet at kojoshow, but do it early and do it often. Otherwise, you may not get through at all. Tom Sherwood, tell me why. Metro General Manager Paul Wiederfeld is taking disciplinary action against 28 employees, which is roughly half the track inspection department, and accusing them of a disturbing level of indifference, lack of accountability, and flagrant misconduct? Well, as Martin DeCaro and others reported this week, you know, he fired people because they were, uh, he says, falsifying safety records and inspections. And there's one thing for tracks to not be in good condition. There's another thing for the, the cars of Metro not to be in good condition, the 1,000 cars. But it's another if the employees of Metro look at the tracks or don't look at the tracks and don't report the problems. It's uh, This is uh, Paul Wedefell's, the general manager's effort to say, we are going to do the jobs we're supposed to do here. We've got lots of problems with budgets and other issues, but if you're not doing your job, your job is on the line. Now, the union has responded saying, well, you know, these employees weren't very well trained. They weren't giving clear instructions. Well, that will all be played out in if, if, the union, if and when the union appeals those firings. But the fact is, a lot of people who ride Metro and who would like to ride Metro, like me, who I don't anymore, would like to see Metro get control of its staff. I still ride Metro, and my safety is what is my primary concern when I ride Metro. How did this, what did this, uh, what was your reaction to this, Mayor Bowser? Uh, well, the general manager had given me a heads up some months ago that he had some concerns about uh, documentation uh, just in general and making sure that employees are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, now, obviously, we want employees to have uh, their due process, but we also expect the gen- general manager to hold everybody accountable. Uh, And what uh, I think that it also does, and more than these 28 uh, particular employees or this particular incident, uh, I think it helps set um, a new standard for how the safety culture must be uh, if Metro is to improve. And, Mayor, it's not just safety. It's it's the shockwave that there are a variety of bureaucratic jobs that have to be done for the trains to run on time and to run at all. And so that's kind of the message, too, is that whatever your job is, whether it's safety or whether it's a customer relations, whether you're that employee in the booth that doesn't look up when somebody comes to ask you a question or where you don't talk to people, that across the board you've heard all the complaints about employees. Many of them work hard, do good jobs. But Most the of image, them. Most but, of them right, do. Right, yes. So the image, though, is if it, it's it's a terrible system that needs money, it needs re- uh, reorganization, and that's what we're in the midst of right now. Well, I think it's also incumbent upon the general manager as we go out, and I certainly I have across this region uh, in talking and in, in talking to uh, my um, my colleagues about what the system needs. Part of that discussion is making sure that Metro is getting its own house in order, and and talking about safety culture, um, talking about right sizing its budget uh, and talking about delivering on the reliability improvements that they say they're making. So if we're asking uh, riders uh, to endure safe track, uh, to endure shortened hours, uh, we must also be uh, assured that the track work is getting done properly. Uh, And only the general manager in the bureaucracy at Metro uh, will be able to ensure that. You mentioned shortened hours. The WMATA board voted to uh, introduce the new schedule on July 1st, it will close Metro Rail at 1 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights, 11.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday, and 11 p.m. Sunday through June 2019. The D.C. board members were thinking of vetoing it. Clearly, D.C. is not happy with this. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, my thought is that we have to have a system that's safe and reliable, and it is the responsibility of the general manager to lay out the plan uh, to get us there. Uh, but we, it will make no sense uh, to make all these improvements 
sense to our system if it's not serving um, the region during the hours that it's open and not serving all parts of the region. And so that's very important. Uh, I think the board members and certainly um, I support them in making sure that any adjustment to the hours is not permanent. Uh, now, I probably would have liked to see a one year at a time uh, discussion, but they agreed on two years uh, and we're going to hold uh, the, the system accountable uh, in, in delivering on the metrics that they said they would. Well, you know, part of the problem is when this first started talking, people talked about cutting back the hours. Initially, people said, oh, well, people won't be able to go out at night and go to the bars so they won't be able to get home. And that's, of course, not only a, just a small part of the issue. The issue is People who are working late at night. Absolutely. And, what, and people who, like Jesse Jackson used to say, take the early bus to get to work Absolutely. in the morning. And it's it, the concern is for these next two years, starting next July, assuming it starts in July, is that people who do have lower income jobs and who do have the transportation problems and family, they're going to have a very difficult time. They're going to have a difficult um, time. I'm encouraged that uh, the authority has looked to expand some bus service, and they may need to do even more over the course of the next uh, several couple of years to um, identify, um, you know, the, the, the particular problem routes where people aren't able to get home. Um, so I'm going to encourage them to look at it. But you point, uh, Tom, to kind of a myth of late night service and, and in fact, the, the role that public public transportation plays. Uh, it is a lifeline for, for many people. And it's not just for Washingtonians. Um, the people that you're talking about uh, quite frequently are going out into the suburbs. Um, they come to jobs in the district and around the region uh, and go home to the suburbs. So it's not just a D.C. issue and it's not just a, a party goers issue. Uh, it is an issue of whether this public transportation system is going to serve the public need and the public good. If Kojo will let me, I'll wrap up transportation by doing a very brief, won't even be a rant this time, but I want to mention that the lack of enforcement in rush hour. We already, we have problems with Beach Drive being closed now and Metro being serviced in various ways. But I have driven around the city and I have seen there there is a lack of enforcement. There's double parked cars, there's parking in rush hour lanes, there's truck offloading because they can't I think find we've heard this before. <laughs> I, I, yeah, but she hasn't been here to hear it. And I'm going to stop within 10 seconds. I don't know where the Public Works Department's traffic enforcement, uh, I, they write tickets for cars parked all day long, and that's fine with me if they're illegal, but I don't see any, I see like a capitulation when it comes to rush hour enforcement, morning well, and night. Not a, not at all. And so one thing that is clear that as we grow as a city, and let's keep in mind that we're adding a thousand people uh, every month, businesses and all over the city and places where there haven't been businesses before, uh, we have an impact on other parts of our system, including the roadways that you mentioned are closed, uh, reduced hours or metro. So there, there are more cars on the street. And I think that the fact that um, uh, we see some some bottleneck areas uh, increasingly in different places in the district demonstrates how important it is uh, for us to have our public transportation system fixed uh, because I can't have enough traffic control officers uh, to, to to deal with increased volumes of cars that come from all over the region. If I would just you say met there with are, President-elect Donald Trump I in New York, York last week. Let me finish with this. <laughs> you, said he's a, you said he is a supporter of the district. What does that mean? Tea. Well, uh, I will I will tell you, it was important for me, Kojo, to get in front of the president-elect so he was real clear about who we are in Washington, D.C., uh, and what the District of Columbia is as a city, county, and a state. I don't have to tell you when you go to different places in the country and some places right around uh, this region, uh, people think that we're a ward of the federal government, that we don't pay our own way. Uh, and I wanted to, to be clear to the president president-elect that uh, we do pay our own way uh, and we're no more dependent on the federal government than any state. In fact, more people um, pay, people pay more taxes in Washington, D.C. than in 22 states. We're larger than 22 states and 80 percent of us came out on November uh, the 8th and said that we wanted to become um, the 51st state. So that is the message I wanted to, to send to the president-elect in addition uh, well, to some me, of... What was his reaction to that? Well, I think he listened very 
in, intently. And, mm-hmm. um, and I talked to him, in fact, about how his own transition was proceeding and the, own, the experience that I had just two years ago in, in our transition. Uh, and so he is aware of the school reform efforts that have been underway uh, in the district. He spent a lot, a lot of time uh, talking uh, about that. Um, and we also spent some time talking about preps for uh, the inauguration. Your turn. Well, um, one of the fear a lot of people have, I've expressed it, uh, is that I'm not so much worried that Trump is going to uh, small potatoes try to involve himself in the city, but the Republican conservative Congress and House is going to move to gut anything that's left of uh, budget autonomy where the city's going to spend its own local money without congressional specific congressional approval, that it may uh, weaken the city's gun laws to just a federal standard, to allow open carry and all these other things to make it easier to get a permit to carry a gun, that it may roll back the city's marijuana law, uh, that the Congress, what is, I'm concerned about where you are in the Congress. I don't know how big your congressional liaison office is, but that seems to be more of a problem than what Trump might do, because uh, frankly, no one knows what Trump's going to do. Well, I think that you are, you're right, um, that our biggest concern is working with the Congress. They're more ideological than um, than a, we think a Trump White House would be. Uh, they have already expressed uh, interest in some of our local laws over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think they may also feel emboldened by the by the recent election. Uh, so our approach, you know, Tom, that I created an office. We never had an office for federal and regional affairs in the district. I created an office that's led by um, Beverly Perry. Uh, and I have uh, tasked uh, that office and our whole government with really analyzing um, what, uh, what our opportunities and vulnerabilities would be um, with, with the new landscape. And our approach is that we are going to work on both uh, sides of the aisle like we have done uh, in the previous years and protect the values uh, of the District of Columbia. Can, can I ask a political question now? Sure. Not that that wasn't one. You're halfway through your term. It's, it's kind of it's a blink of the eye, as they say in the Bible. <laughs> um, what you, where are you on a, you start out fresh pack, which you, you, you put, you closed after there was some criticism of how it was done, but where are you in running for re-election? You've told us you're going to run for re-election. When you first ran, you started out in March, well, a year and a half before the election. You don't have to do that as the incumbent, but just politics now. When will you, I don't know where your campaign committee is, when will you start raising money? Because, you know, Adrian Fenty raised $5 million and it didn't really help him. How, how are you now going forward into 2017, getting ready to run in 2018? Well, I'm focused on running the government, uh, and the, the politics usually handles itself. And you know how I run. I run hard, and I run fast, and I, I'll do it again. So you have a deadline, a, a date of when no, you will form? I don't. You don't have a committee in place now, is that I right? I don't. So nobody can give you money now if they wanted to. I, I don't have a campaign committee. Put on your headphones, please, because we're about to hear about the issue of homelessness that I was going to raise, but I let Jesse from Miriam's Kitchen in D.C. do it. Jesse, you are on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Mayor Bowser. Forty-two people from D.C.'s homeless community have died this year. Many people, after they were matched to a voucher, waiting to move into housing. I was wondering if you right now can commit to fully funding the need for permanent supportive housing, which we know is an What is permanent supportive housing? Yeah, permanent supportive housing is a gold standard uh, intervention for people experiencing homelessness. It pays for their, uh, it covers their rent, and it also provides supportive case management services. And it really is helping people who are experiencing chronic homeless. Uh, Really, it saves lives. Okay, allow me to have the mayor respond. Um, so I think Jesse uh, would know that we have spent two years doing more uh, to end homelessness in the district than I have personally experienced in the than almost 10 years I've been in D.C. government. Uh, and we're very um, proud of that. I think that there is, a, as he notes, uh, there remains a, a lot to do. And part of our approach has been to, to fix the system. Uh, we have diverse.
diverted more people from coming into the system, for example, with our homeless prevention services um, than has has ever been done. Uh, We've also been committed uh, to closing and replacing uh, our largest family shelter, D.C. General, uh, and making sure that we have right-sized short-term family housing uh, across the city. Um, But more than that, once we fix the system and making sure that we're serving D.C. residents and we're serving D.C. residents with emergencies, uh, the, the other part of the equation is making sure that there's affordable housing available for people. And uh, we have an unprecedented commitment in our budget to that and also getting um, those funds at, out the door. Uh, so the question about permanent supportive housing is a good one because we know that many people, uh, they need services. But one thing that we have also found is that they need additional help navigating, even once they have vouchers. Um, people are finding it difficult to get into housing. Uh, So two things that uh, uh, Director Zeilinger is is working on uh, is to create a fund, uh, and we're we're trying to um, get that, seed that fund, uh, so that we can give landlords some additional assurance that if they work with uh, somebody is coming with a voucher from uh, the city, uh, that they will have a little bit less risk, and this fund uh, may be able to help them. Putting the navigators in place has also been helpful because people who've experienced homelessness and experienced trauma, even with a voucher, sometimes they just don't know how to navigate uh, the system to go out and help uh, to to help themselves find find housing. So we need to help them do that. So our commitment is unprecedented. I look forward to going into this budget year, uh, also getting the hundred million dollars in um, in all of the things that the system needs. Uh, to make sure it's functioning as an emergency system for D.C. residents. You've embraced the housing first concept. If you can get somebody stable in a home, they can make you can help them better. But one of the issues politically has been your uh, your dramatic move to close D.C. General by opening shelters in all eight wards. You've you've had some real pushback in Ward Five and Ward Three, particularly. Um, do you think you can meet your goal to to have all those shelters open and running by 2018, or have the problems? Uh, going to push that deadline past that. It's not the year. problems; it's the changes. Um, the, the council, council changed. changed it and had three additional uh, sites, and those sites now are going through the process that the previous sites had already been through. Um, so we expect those three new sites um, to go before the board of zoning adjustment in March. Um, my team was out uh, just this week, I believe, in the, the three new sites areas talking about uh, the updates uh, to the design. Uh, So the council, uh, by its changes, uh, has kind of put the construction of those new sites out to 2020. So you're not going to meet the 2018. You had initially said that most optimistically that you hope to end homelessness in the city, I think, by 2020. So it's like government and everything gets pushed back, right? You try it no matter how hard you try, no matter what happens. Well, no, I I feel like um, very strongly that the the changes that we make to from diverting people from homelessness to right sizing the system to make it an emergency system, not a queuing system for affordable housing, and uh, we will need some additional legislative changes that will be controversial, um, and uh, the the I'm asking the council to to vote on them early in in the new year. I know that you've been talking to people. Excuse me, one more quick. I know you've been talking to people in private meetings. You've had people to your home just talking in general about your reelection and where you, what you've done well, what you could do better, how do you get prepared, and that seems to be one of the issues. Is what in Ward Three where you've got a actually, lot of actually I haven't been talking to anybody at my home about you my had reelection. People? I no, have people well, I at apologize. my house all the time. Oh, yes, I'm talking about issues. I, well, I certainly want to call it politics, but you've had people to your lovely home in Northwest, and you've talked about issues that are important to the city. I, I, I interpret that, that as in, politics. In, but anyway. I do that at my home. I do that in but, community rooms. But, but, I do that at churches. I do that on walks. Ward 3, yes. I do, do that everywhere. Yes, and Ward 3, though, is, is one of the key wards for your reelection. And this homeless shelter at Idaho Avenue has caused some heart 
burn? Um, well, I think when I'm in Ward 3 and they're talking about Idaho Avenue, they um, particularly have questions for the council about the process, um, about how the, the site was was selected. Um, but I also can go all across Ward 3 and people say we want to end homelessness and we recognize that we have a part to play in it. Okay. Um, so I, I would push back on you, Tom, in suggesting that uh, Ward 3 residents are somehow less engaged or committed uh, to making sure that everybody in the District of Columbia has a, a safe place to stay. Okay, I, I got a problem. They, have a, they, got a problem. they agree with the goal. I got a problem. They don't we only have process. one minute and 30 seconds left to our next break, and we got a gazillion people who want to talk about paid leave, so I'm going to ask all of them to hold on to the line until after we come back from the break, and in the minute we have left, I'm going to have Peter in Washington, D.C., who wants to talk about something else. Peter, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor. Uh, Hi. My, my question is about uh, school modernization. I mean, the city has a budget surplus of about $2.2 billion, and there's still a, uh, a huge unmet need uh, in terms of schools that haven't been touched, who've only been partially touched, who projects have been scaled back. And I was just wondering if you're prepared to consider using any of the surplus funds, uh, you know, to accelerate the school modernization process. Madam Mayor. So um, <clears throat> you are right to ask about it, and we have a, uh estimate of what we still need to do. So since 2007, uh, we've invested about $4 billion in improving our schools. And you will hear me say time and time again uh, that our uh, commitment to transforming schools, not just the school buildings, but what happens inside, uh, is directly related to the renaissance of our city. So I'm very committed to it. Last year, for example, uh, we found an additional $221 million to add to the capital improvements program to advance uh, more schools. Uh, we estimate that we have about $1.5 billion worth of work remaining. We have eight schools um, that haven't been touched in our, in our current CIP, um, CIP. only for, for our capital improvements plan, Thank but you. only for planning, and five schools that haven't even made it uh, to the, the budget document for planning. So 13 schools haven't been touched. 35 schools um, have had what we call a phase one update, which means they, they got, uh, you know, some work, but more work remains. So we need $1.5 billion, which is doable. Our Your question about surplus uh, is we don't exactly have a surplus. What we have are operate. We have there reserves. Goes my minute, but go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so to, to use reserves, um, we would not be using reserves um, to invest in the capital improvements plan, um, but we do need to identify a source to get to what we need. I can say more about what the CFO has recommended, which I think is prudent um, and will help us get there. Our guest is Muriel Bowser, Mayor of the District of Columbia. Tom Sherwood is our resident analyst. He's a reporter with NBC4 and a columnist with the current newspapers. We'll be back shortly. I'm Hojo Nam. Welcome back to to the Politics Hour with Tom Sherwood. He's our resident analyst, a reporter with NBC4, and a columnist with the current newspapers. Our guest today, Muriel Bowser, mayor of the District of Columbia. There are several people who want to talk about paid family leave. I will start with Diana in Ward 2. Diana, you are on the air. Go ahead, please. I live and work here in D.C., and my son was born very prematurely and spent months in a D.C. hospital. Mayor Bowser, how do you expect workers and families going through situations like mine to give their children the care and attention to ensure they have the very best possible start in life if they don't have access to paid leave and are expected to return to work while their children are still in critical care in the hospital if you don't support the passage of the Universal Paid Leave Act? Before Mayor Bowser responds to that, I'll add a few more people to that conversation. You should know that the D.C. Council advanced one of the nation's most generous paid leave policies in the country, and that Mayor Bowser has expressed concerns about that legislation. We got one tweet from someone who says, Mayor Bowser, why such lackluster support for paid leave D.C., a policy that will increase gender equity? And another who says, ask Mayor Bowser why she doesn't support access to paid leave, even though 80 percent of D.C. residents want to see it pass. And then there is this from Alan in Washington. Alan, your turn. Thanks, Kojo. Hi, Mayor. How are you? Great. 
Uh, I guess I'm one of the 80% of people that supports paid leave in concept, but I'm a little worried that the $250 million or something to that tune uh, might be better used on more immediate priorities like fixing Metro, as you discussed earlier, earlier or, or you know, building better schools, affordable housing, that sort of thing. I mean, at this point, with all of with that context, this paid family leave seems like a bit of a luxury item. Um, and, and I also read that two thirds of the benefits will go to people who don't live in the city. So I, I don't know that is this really a, a necessary thing to take up at this point in time when we need to spend on so many other things. I think we've touched most of the bases. Right, you got a, you got a lot coming coming um, with those questions, and I think that the the point that I would like to make is that certainly uh, I want to support DC families. That's that's my job, and I think there are a lot of ways that we can support DC families. And the question is, is the measure before us the best way to do it? So I have expressed concerns um, over uh, what's on the table at the council now, uh, which is a tax increase on all D.C. businesses, the big ones, the medium ones, and the little ones. Um, and it's not an, insignific- not an insignificant one. It would actually raise almost $250 million, and the bill would require me to create a new government agency. Uh, a $250 million agency would make it about the fifth largest expenditure in D.C. government. Uh, so after the police and schools and and Metro um, and our our insurance programs, it would be the paid family leave program. So it would be uh, almost three times as much as we're spending on affordable housing, more than we're spending on parks and recreation, more than we spend on public works, more than we spend on our transportation programs, the fifth largest expenditure. Uh, So when uh, somebody comes and says they want to raise taxes on D.C. businesses, the big ones, the medium ones, the little ones, they want to raise $250 million then I have the obligation to ask, uh, is that the best expenditure for D.C. families? And then when you look at it, what you'll find is two-thirds of the benefits um, are going to go to Maryland and Virginia workers, uh, Maryland and Virginia residents. So should we spend our money that we raise from our businesses paying benefits to families in Potomac or to Loudoun County? And that's, that's, that is my my, my huge concern. May I ask one of the immediate responses to that is, well, this, you em- embrace the $15 an hour minimum wage, which we will hit, I think, by 2020, <laughs> and the majority of workers who will earn that money live in the suburbs. Well, there's a huge difference, Tom, is that we aren't increasing taxes to do it, and it does not require uh, me to create an agency that the, C- the, C- the independent CFO says could take between uh, 40 and 80 million dollars just to create the the system the computer system and the technology to implement the program and it would take uh, 18 months to two years to build it out and then it would take another 12 months uh, to uh, to actually collect the taxes and then the benefits could be a- available, maybe by 2020. So it's very different to say that we're going to create a, a, a government-run insurance program uh, to saying we're going to have an employer mandate. Now, if the council wanted to consider an employer mandate for paid family leave, and as I understand it, there are several council members that are circulating uh, that alternative. Jack Evans and Mary Che among them. That's that's what I understand. Uh, that it, it's saying that we're going to have an employer mandate for paid family leave, um, like we did for the minimum wage, is very different uh, than saying you're going to create a new program that costs $250 million, will take three years to set up and implement the benefits, and then it benefits two-thirds um, of, of the people with benefits are outside. And the first caller who, who talked about uh, her family situation, and certainly I would want her to be able to spend uh, time with with her family. But, you know, this program excludes many D.C. residents. It pays for many Maryland and Virginia residents, and it excludes many D.C. residents that work for the federal government. Uh, And many federal workers are D.C. residents. And so uh, if you ask me, wouldn't I want D.C. families to participate in paid family leave? The answer is yes, but this $250 million bill leaves them out. 
How about the, the politics can, of this? Some oh, of that's closest, exactly what I want to speak go ahead. about. Here's the politics of this. Uh, the, the employer mandate would be just like the, the minimum wage. You, you direct employers in the city to provide, if they have more than 50 employees, they must provide minimum wage. This is the proposal being circulated now as the alternative. If you have more than 50 employees, you have to mandate the, the, the paid family leave. If you have under 50, you'll get a tax credit, something like $200 per employee, so you can also do it. That's kind of the rough outlines. This, this uh, paid family leave passed, I think, 11 to 2 or close to that. And, but now, with the vote coming up, and here's the politics, folks, the next vote is December the 20th, next week. There may not be enough nine votes for the, what the council passed a week and a half ago. If you veto it, and would I'll ask you, are you considering possibly vetoing the bill if it passes as it stands now? And there may not be nine votes on the council to override your veto. And then what happens next? Well, I can't predict what the council will do on Tuesday, um, because even at this this time, a few days before the vote, I know that there are serious alternatives um, circulating. So my job will be uh, to do uh, what uh, is in the best interest of D.C. families and D.C. taxpayers. You know, Peter asked a question a little bit earlier about school modernization, for example. He says, you know, I identified we need another $1.5 billion. I even think there are additional alternatives. If you're going to raise $250 million, the council, in my view, I hear this from the ward council members every budget season. We want, just like Peter said, to advance and com- finish our promises to families and neighborhoods across the city. Should a portion of that $250 million be dedicated uh, to our capital needs? Uh, the CFO says if we invest $320 million um, in what we call pay-as-you-go uh, capital investments, we can take care of all of our capital needs over the next 10 years. So the politics of this is it's uncertain where you will end up on this. You've opposed the current bill as it stands. It's uncertain you'd like to, where the council is going to well, end up but on I'm this. But I'm saying, and on this possible man, employer mandate, which which Jack Evans and others say would be in place quicker, a couple of years earlier than the, the proposal on the table now, you will look at that. But you want paid family leave, but you want to be able to afford it. Is that kind of a nice summary? Well, I hope that, and this is what um, I think for the members of the council, too. While I I disagree with with their approach, um, I hope it doesn't come down to a politics question, um, but it comes down to a good governance and good policy question. And that's that's what they're called to do. Um, And while I recognize that um, many people are... um, are committed to just one idea, uh, they should be opened up to do what's in the best interest of the taxpayer and D.C. families. That's our obligation. It's not our obligation to take care of the whole region. And unfortunately, that's what um, this bill in its present form The Washington do. Post recently did a series on the unintended consequences of the district's youth rehabilitation Act, an 80s-era law aimed at giving young offenders another chance, but which the reporting indicates has in many cases given violent offenders many chances and allowing cases to fall through the cracks, leading some free to commit terrible crimes. We got an email from Jeffrey, who wants to ask the mayor about the Youth Rehabilitation Act. A large number of criminals sentenced under this act have committed extremely violent crimes, writes Jeffrey. Um, What do you plan on doing about that? Well, we are um, very concerned about it. Uh, I certainly support the notion of deserving nonviolent young offenders uh, having the opportunity to be rehabilitated uh, and um, after they have um, served their kind of rehabilitation period with the district, being able to go on and live productive lives without being marred by um, a, you know, the types of a record that could go with a nonviolent offense. The act, in my view, though, uh, was never intended uh, to cover violent offenders. Uh, and we think, and I think what the, the Post has pointed to, uh, may be the misapplication um, of the Youth Act. It was never intended uh, to uh, cover violent offenders. My belief is that the people of the District of Columbia, and I certainly do, want to make sure that justice is served when we have violent crimes in our city. So I think that there are a couple of things. Um, 
Um, certainly, the council could clarify uh, in the law uh, that the application should be to nonviolent offenders. Uh, I, I also think that I'm going to tap our CJCC, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, to uh, look at uh, what we think may have been some misapplied instances of the law and uh, give us a recommendation. You we have also, three minutes and 40 seconds. Very left. quick. You, you, you've met with the U.S. Attorney and I think the courts too to try to make sure that violent criminals stay in but the overall issue of crime which is always a very sensitive political issue in the city uh, crime is down in several areas uh, from this year compared to last but that's only because there were big increases last year uh, people have said to me you look at the crime stats crime is up over the first two years of your time in office and that could be a political issue for you going Actually, in for a re-election. Actually, it's down. It's down no. in, in all categories, but I think one since 2014. Well, homicide, assault with deadly weapons, robbery with guns, citywide are up. Homicides are even in Ward 4. Homicides are up in Ward 4. I think there was something like six last year, and there have been 13 this Homicides year. Homicides are down by 18%. In the city. Citywide, But yes. in, ward, in Ward 7, they're up like 33% Well, or something. there are generally places, um, and when we look across the city, uh, where we know we have concentrated areas of, of violent crime, and we are from preventative services to policing services attacking that violent crime. But let me be clear, all ca that, all, the homicides are down across the district. From what uh, period of time? From last year to this year. Uh, and the, the only, I think, there may be two categories that were up overall between 14 and 16. You have a new uh, chancellor who's probably going to be confirmed by the council next week. Uh, what about Peter Newsham? He's the interim uh, police chief. Uh, he's he has a pretty good record in town of being getting around. People like him very similar to Kathy Lanier. Uh, where are you on selecting a new police chief, which is as you, again, go into the preparation for re-election? Um, well, whether I was going into re-election or not, uh, the process for selection uh, a police chief would, would be the same. Uh, we are uh, fortunate in our city to have a police department that has been moving in the right direction for many years. Uh, we have invested in public safety in, in some unprecedented ways. For example, last year, I mean, la yesterday, um, we outfitted all of our police officers, our patrol officers with, with body-worn cameras. We've made significant investments in our crime lab, um, and we're, we're seeing the, the benefits of all of those things. And so uh, we're going to do, be doing some, some check-ins um, with, with community leaders about what they want to see uh, in the next police chief, and then I'll be making a decision sometime after the inauguration. Do only have also in January, okay. Only have time for one more question. Two former GSA employees have filed lawsuits in the past two weeks alleging they were fired for not steering a major construction contract to a donor of yours. There's a lawsuit underway, and the council conducted closed-door hearings on that matter. Now the D.C. Inspector General's office indicated that uh, he is going to look into, or the Inspector General is, is going to look into this, is looking into this. Was your office in any way involved in, the, in directing the Department of General Services to favor certain contractors? Certainly not. And uh, we have been, and I know you had the city administrator on, um, um, some some weeks ago uh, to talk about these issues. We've been very pleased to answer uh, the council's questions um, and we we are hopeful that they have all that they need from us and we'll wrap up their deliberation. It's a, the concern is that there's so much construction going on in town. You've, you're, you're, you're in fact promoting this part of your job as mayor, but that some contractors are are playing fast and loose with politics and, and, and uh, contract awards, and, and that this may not be the only case, the, the Wizards practice facility and the, uh, the new soccer stadium, uh, land clearing deals. Are you worried at all that people might be bending the law? Well, I, we were I worried no. that people were bending the law, um, and and I can't say too much about um, personnel uh, matters. You you've mentioned that there's there's litigation pending, uh, and I will say that we have made everybody in in our government available to answer the council's questions. Not everybody who's making these salacious accusations has made themselves available, um, but where we have been more than happy to to answer those questions. Our 
guest, Muriel Bowser, is the mayor of the District of Columbia. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kojo. Tom Sherwood is our resident analyst. He's a reporter with NBC4 and a columnist with the current newspapers who, because he made us run over, now has to go with me to help with the membership campaign. that we Did I bring up involved. traffic uh, enforcement? <laughs> no, you, you did at the big I'll beginning I'll be tweeting of the about it later. Tune in. Thank you for I'm joining us. And thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nandi.